Hello, my name is Gary Wade, and this is July 24, 2000. I'm at the Tennessee Supreme Court building in Knoxville to interview former lawyer, retired chancellor, the Honorable Chester S. Rainwater, Jr., as a part of the Legal History Project for the Tennessee Bar Foundation. State your name for the record. Chester Samuel Rainwater, Jr. And when and where were you born, Judge Rainwater? I was born in Dandridge, Tennessee on January the 4th, 1919. And your father's name? My father's name was Chester Samuel Rainwater, Sr. And was there anything uh, significant about either of your names? Any? No, origin? it's just a name that was passed down, and I always understood that the name had to have a biblical uh, name within it, so the Samuel met that requirement, and that's what my father had. And, and I, I expect that that was expected of the rainwaters on your mother's side. You had you had some ministers in the family, as I understand. Well, my grandfather, my uh, maternal grandfather, was a doctor, a licensed medical doctor, and also an ordained Baptist uh, minister. What was your mother's name? She was Sarah Ethel. Uh, Hoskins. And her father, Dr. Hoskins? Dr. L.D. Hoskins. And where did they live? Pineville, Kentucky. And who delivered you, by the way? Uh, my grandfather. He came down t from Kentucky to Dan. Obviously he did. I don't recall it. <laughs> but he's, his name's on my birth certificate and he told me so. I suspect that that would be admissible in a court of law. Is that I think so. Uh, the hearsay rule would not apply, would it? What were, was the date of birth of your father, Mr. Rainwater? Uh, April the 14th, 1893. And how long a life did he have? He died in 1987 in January, it was 90, it, nearly 94. And your mother, when was she born? Uh, she was born uh, in July of uh, eight, uh, 1898 and died in December of 1966. I could give you the days, but I'm not that important. Any any special talents on the on your mother's side? She was a major in uh, music. Um, she loved music. She uh, taught the piano some. She uh, directed choirs in our local church and uh, had a wonderful voice until later years. And uh, she developed allergies that a lot of people do. And she couldn't go into a church uh, to hold practice or to uh, direct a choir if there was a vase of flowers there. And so she had to finally just give it up. Well, did you receive any musical talent from her side of the family, or would you say your father had a more important impact on your life? Well, my father definitely. Uh, the musical side of it was never one of mine. And, of course, your father was a lawyer. Yes. And you practiced law with him for many years. Yes. And sort of take us along his career because it had a, it had a major impact on your career. Um, my father and mother met as students at Lincoln Memorial University. Your father's a baseball player. Uh, he was there on a baseball scholarship. And um, they... Uh, met and uh, married in 1917, in December of 1917. Uh, my father was offered a contract with the Boston Braves. He was a shortstop. But my mother talked him out of it and they got married and my father went to teaching. A much better job in those days, <laughs> teaching. Well, it's quite different, I'm sure, than uh, what it is today. How long did his teaching career last? Not, not too long. Um, um, he uh, ran for the office of county court clerk in 1918 and uh, was elected. That would mean that he took uh, office on September 1st of 1918. And he held that office until 1938. Lived through the Depression then as yes. county court clerk. Well, the Depression wasn't over in 1938, but it was better than what it had been sometimes. 
And as I understand, right in the midst of the Depression, he decided to go to law school. That's right. And where did he go? Went to the John, John, John M. Neal uh, Knight School of Law uh, in Knoxville. Do you remember what years he was there? Uh, not exactly, uh, but it was in the early 30s. And uh, <clears throat> uh, why I remember it so well, I, he and Mr. H. V. Jarnigan, Sr., who was the president and mainly the owner of the local bank, decided that uh, they both wanted to study law and to get their law license. So they would go drive down together two nights a week and they had rigged a light in, on the dash of the car so that the non-driver could read the law and they both could discuss it. Well, I was just old enough to uh, go along with them and want to go along with them because they would drive up in front of the T Tennessee Theater and let me out and I'd go to a movie. And then the two hours that their class was over, they'd come by and pick me up. And that's my way of getting to the big city. So your first interest in the law was through your first, your dad's career as county court clerk, and then secondly, you actually studied law with him from 31 through 33. I'm afraid I didn't do much study. <laughs> <laughs> um, about all I could say was I was pressed. <laughs> of course, he's, he practiced law until his death in 1987 in Dandridge, yes. and the firm name was Rainwater and Rainwater. Correct. And, and just an aside, before, before you took the bench as chancellor, you had the, the happy experience of, of having three generations of rainwaters practice in Dandridge. Yes, uh, uh, my son, uh, our son, our wife and our son, uh, Sanford, um, passed the bar and um, was, uh, of course, introduced to the uh, Supreme Court right here in this, this room. And um, we had our picture taken by the newspaper on the front steps as being the only three-generation law firm in the state of Tennessee. That's quite a distinction. Just to digress a moment, we, we have talked about your mother and your father. Uh, let's talk about your paternal grandparents for just a moment. They had Jefferson County roots, did they not? Yes. Now, um, my paternal grandfather, as I've, I've always understood it, died before my father was born. And uh, at least my father never knew uh, his father. And um, his family were uh, tenant, tenant farmers in Jefferson County. Um, they eked out their living from uh, year to year on doing farm work. Um, my father, I guess, had a little more ambition and um, went to school, went to uh, high school, uh, and um, then uh, worked his way into a, uh, to LMU out on scholarship for, to play baseball because he was playing. And, and your, your son, Sandy, as, as we know him, was named for your grandfather, Sanford Rainwater, mm -hmm. and your paternal grandmother was Mary or Sarah Jane Hill. Yes. And many, Hill's a very common name in, oh, in yes. Jefferson County even, yes. even today, is it not? Yes. Probably more relatives there than, than you know. Well, it, it thinned out quite a bit, but that's true. <laughs> and in uh, and, and days gone by, the hills and the rainwaters were very prolific in the And on Jefferson your... County. And on your mother's side, you've, you've already, or your, uh, your, your mother's side, her, her parents, uh, Dr. L.D. Hoskins and his wife, Rachel, lived in Pineville, Kentucky. Uh, did they continue to live there until yeah. their deaths? Yeah. Well, uh, not until their deaths. Uh, um, as I say, he, he had his uh, doctor's office downtown in, in Pineville, and um, he would... Uh, minister to the miners and their families in all that area, delivered babies at all hours of the day and night. We'd go visit. <laughs> He'd be up and out and back. And then on Sundays, he went to the pulpit and, and preached. He was a tall, uh, stately, 
uh, knowledgeable uh, man and knew what he wanted to do. And, uh, but uh, as I, during the war, uh, when I was away, uh, as I understood, they moved to uh, Knoxville. If I say they, he and, he and his wife, because of uh, failing health and that he died uh, here in Knoxville uh, sometime in the early 19, uh, in 1940. Before we get to the impact that uh, he had on your mother and through uh, your mother, you, uh, let's, let's talk about a special day in your life, August 19th, 1942. Well, that's when my wife drug me to the altar. Well, she may get access to this video, so I'm not so sure that we ought to be totally candid in, in what we have to say. Well, the truth will out, you know. <laughs> Her maiden name was? Trenholm, T-R-E-N-H-O-L-M. Phyllis Trenholm Rainwater. Mm -hmm. And you had two children, have two children. Two children. Our oldest was a daughter, Marlene, now married to McClellan, lives in Atlanta. And then our son, Sanford T. <laughs> Rainwater. Who is a lawyer? Yes, um, and not practicing, but uh, well, Marlene yeah. also has. Uh, She's paralegal, so she does legal work as well. It, yeah. it runs in the family. Then uh, your your wife Phyllis's parents had an interesting heritage as well. Uh, her father was born in Nova Scotia, and her mother was born in Brantford. Uh, I believe Brantford. Uh, Canada, and um, they uh, found it here. I, there's an interesting story there. I don't know all the details, but apparently uh, Phyllis's mother was uh, a nurse, and um, she was uh, looking after some member of the family, and they were going to Texas. In those days, they sent uh, people to the west for the change in weather. And um, whoever that person was got sick as the train went through Knoxville. Had to take him off the train. And uh, I think it was a, a him rather than a her. And uh, they took the hospital. And at the hospital they met Herbert Acuff, who was the uh, outstanding uh, physician here in Knoxville at, at that time. And uh, the story goes that uh, as a result of uh, their coming into contact and, and Dr. Acuff needing a nurse assistance, uh, eventually the Trent Holmes moved to Knoxville. He went to work for Prudent Coal Company. And um, she, uh, she did some nursing, and uh, they uh, bought a home in Knoxville, and he made her uh, back and forth to Prudent on the weekends. And uh, my wife and her older sister were born in Prudent. How did you meet Phyllis? At the fraternity house at uh, UT, the well, dances. Let's go back in time just a little bit. You, there was more family to the Rainwaters than Chester, Jr. You had a brother and a sister. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what were their names? My brother was, uh, younger brother was Charles, Charles Otis Rainwater, and I had a sister, Betty Jean Rainwater. Charles had a long and distinguished career in the real estate and auction business in Jefferson County. And, and during the war in the uh, military. He was a pilot. A pilot. A pilot. Yeah. Fighter, fighter, pilot. The fighter pilot. And was the first to, to fly into, into Tokyo during World War uh, II. The first to fly a fire, fighter plane over Tokyo. He was about a year and a half younger than you. How about your, your sister, Betty Rainwater Jones? She was born in 26, seven years. Uh, now. now there's an interesting connection in the Jones side of the family with your legal career too. Your your firm is still as in existence and who is the senior partner now in the law firm of Rainwater and Rainwater? My nephew Jeffrey Jones, uh, uh, my sister's son and uh, it's now uh, the firm is Rainwater, Jones and Drennan. 
a young fellow by the name of Doug Drennan. Another person out of that firm that you've had a strong relationship with over the years is, is the new chancellor in your district. Telford Ford. And how long did he practice with you and work with you before he became chancellor? He came uh, in 1975. He was clerking for uh, Judge uh, uh, Parrott here as a, in the Court of Appeals. And um, he was born and raised in uh, Jefferson County. And I knew of his family and uh, I'd followed him somewhat. Uh, and uh, as he went to law school at Memphis State and finally found top judge Parrott into giving him up and he came uh, and joined our firm in 1975. Excellent lawyer. Yes. And so far so good as a chancellor. Uh, that's, that's what I hear. I, uh, now your offices are next door to each other. Does he come over and ask for advice or counsel at any time? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, lawyers are going to talk about their cases with, with fellow lawyers, uh, particularly if they think that uh, they can gain some information or knowledge as, as to it. That's just part of the course. Let's go back to your begin the beginning of your education. The actual beginning was, was in Dandridge at the Maury Elementary School. Well, actually, it was... Uh, just the Dandridge, or the Dandridge Elementary School. At the time, it was separate and apart, and then went to Maury High School. And you you began elementary school in 1925. Did you? Were there any teachers that were special to you during those years? Any that you recall as having an impact on your future? Well, um, Faye Rimmer, who was a local lady there, uh, a wonderful person outstanding teacher. Um, she taught at the lower grades and uh, she was just uh, an excellent, excellent teacher. And as a result, uh, I skipped the fourth and sixth grades at, at her behest and uh, she had to talk my family into it. They weren't too <laughs> sold on the idea. But did, did your family have an idea as to what your professional career was going to be at that time? Yes, uh, um, I was the oldest grandchild in the Hoskins lineup, and uh, it was always planned <laughs> as a family that I would study medicine and be a doctor, following the footsteps of my grandfather. He and I were were real, real close. I would go to and spend time in, in summer sometime and. Uh, to her home in Pineville and drive for him. See, in those days you didn't have driver's license, you didn't have restrictions. All you had to do was just know how to drive a car, get in it, and go. But, but you all, at the same time you had this influence to go in the medical career, your father was the county court clerk, which was the office in Jefferson County at the time. D did you spend much time there as a boy? Every spare time I had. Uh, did, did, did you even have a suspicion at that point in time that law was perhaps your, in your future rather than medicine? Yes, deep down. Uh, I, I just love being around the lawyers. Uh, I was in his office. I had to go from school, um, took from high school, just a couple of blocks downtown to the courthouse. I'd go to his office. And, take over and he'd go home or something and let me leave me there. Uh, we had some others in the office too, but uh, and the courtroom was just uh, off off of his office and, and hear these lawyers yelling and screaming, I'd go in and listen to them. That was that was really where I should have been. You had uh, several good friends among your peers in those years. Who do you remember best looking back on your early years? Who were, who were your best friends during that time? Well, um, as, as friends and, and, and close associates, uh, Ernest Taylor Marstall would, would, I think, top the list. Now, this is after you began your, your legal career, yes, Ernest. Yes, did, uh, did he grow up in Dandridge? No, no he, he's from Marstall. Well, how but, about how about friends that you went to school with at, in Dandridge? 
Well, Eugene Holtzinger, for one, I went to law school, uh, in fact, at the same time that I did, and uh, he, he practiced law. Uh, but other than that, uh, there were no other uh, of my friends that was at least bit interested in law. But you spent quite a bit of time hunting and fishing with uh, some of your friends yes. around the rivers and lakes in your area. See, the, we were right on the banks of the French Broad River, and uh, it would flood uh, periodically all the bottoms, and it was made for when the floods left for good fishing and hunting. And my father was an avid hunter, duck hunter, quail hunter, raised bird dogs, and um, I grew up in that atmosphere and loved it. And uh, during the summer, we'd a uh, group of five, five or six boys about my age, we'd go out and have, I don't know how our parents ever let us do it, but uh, we'd spend a week in the river, put out trot lines, eat fish, kill squirrels, cook them right there on the spot. That, that's hard Sleep to, on the ground. It's hard to imagine today. I, one of the, the questions I thought about asking you was was about summer jobs and time which you spent in employment outside of school, but there weren't a whole lot of jobs available. There weren't, uh, uh, and I guess I never considered one either because but, I had other things on my mind. Did uh, you help out your father during your, oh, your early years? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I helped out in the in his office there, and uh, um, in fact, uh, I think I knew about as much of <laughs> the office as he did. He, of course, he taught me. And, and when he went into the law practice in 1938, uh, the morning fire was part of the Chester S. Rainwater Jr. ritual, as I understand. Well, uh, a little earlier than that, uh, I guess, but uh, uh, in those days, there was no central heat. Anywhere in the courthouse, you, you, your heat was your fireplace, the grate in the fireplace, and uh, they would want someone to go down early in the morning and build a fire so that uh, when they opened the office around eight o'clock, people who were working in the office and people that came in would be warm. So I think I got fifty cents a week to go down and build that fire at six o'clock in the morning in the office used to do that. I know firsthand that you've been active in the First United Methodist Church of Dandridge for years, and, and as I recall, both your father and mother were members of that oh, church yeah. as well. Now, how did this happen with your grandfather Hoskins being a Baptist minister? <laughs> I don't know that I know the answer <laughs> to that question, but um, uh, the hills and the rainwaters uh, in the county were all Methodist. And um, I say all, but the, the majority of them were. And um, I, my father was brought up as, as a Methodist, and uh, I imagine that uh, he won the <laughs> he won, he won whatever disagreement there might have been about. It. And uh, they uh, he was served in every capacity in the church, I think, except being an ordained minister. You were 16 years of age when you graduated from high school. What? Yes. Uh, did you ever stop and think about what you might do in the future, or did you always know where, where the road led? Well, I, I, was, I was told, and, and it, I'd say told, but uh, it was just generally understood in the family that I would go to college, and study pre-med, go to med school, become a doctor. Followed the footsteps of my maternal grandfather. And how many colleges were on your, your, your list of possibilities? None, except for the University of Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd become attached to the football games that my father would take me to, starting back in the late 20s, in the days of Hack Mack and Bobby Dodd, McEver, all those. The, the General Nealon years at the University Absolutely. of Tennessee. The greatest time of in their football history. And so at age 16, you found yourself a freshman at the University of Tennessee, majoring in? Pre-med. And with it, all those biology and chemistry and English and algebra. 
And did you finish the curriculum in pre-med? The two years, yes. And what happened then? The illness turmoil throughout, uh, the main thing that was going on at that time was the uh, uh, Prince of Wales and uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Wallace Simpson. Uh, uh, yeah, Wallace, Wallace Simpson. And that was all over the radio and all over the papers and everything. Not that that had anything to do with it. But I just wasn't comfortable in uh, that field. I, I stumbled through biology, botany, all those things, chemistry. Well, who did you have to go to to ask permission to do anything different? Well, the one I was worried most about was my mother. Cause I you knew I wouldn't have any trouble with my father. So I just... Uh, decided I'd face it with them. I went home and asked, I cooked up this, uh, if they would let me go to law school for a year, then I'd go on to med school. Well, my dad saw through that right quick. I don't know what my mother did. Uh, but they agreed, and uh, so I never, I had to, I had to lay out several months because law school was on semesters and the, the uh, regular curriculum was on uh, quarters so um, I entered law school in February of uh, 1938 and uh, you're still a relatively young man at that time 19 years of age I am figured it up I guess that's about right well by my calculations you were 19 when you began law school and um, didn't take you long to finish. Finished in August of 1940. I went straight through. And I understand you did pretty well in everything except for maybe one legal bibliography class that See, you did. you're going to bring up uh, my downside now. Well, there's a lot <laughs> yes. of upside. Maybe we'll, we'll get to that. But this is such a great story. You were such a UT football fan at the yes, time. And these true. were, as you say, the glory years, 38, 39. That's right. Um, our um, um, legal bibliography uh, constituted a one-hour course a week, just a one-hour course, and it met at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning in the fall, in the fall, fall the semester. Now, uh, uh, I, I still have been unable to uh, recall the name of the lawyer here in town who formerly was a bankruptcy uh, referee lived out in Fountain City, he taught that course. And he and my dad were great fishermen. They would go together and fish all over the mountain streams and the rivers, and they'd go hunting together. And uh, anyway, um, you only had one cut per semester when you had only in a one-hour course. And um, you couldn't go to football out of town games as the team went and just <laughs> and not go to court uh, but one time. I mean, not, I missed class one time. So you made a value judgment at that time. Well, I went to, I went to the ball games and wound up with an <laughs> F in class, which I deserved. <laughs> and you went to the away games. Those are the games. Oh, those, that those were the games that uh, took you away. I didn't have any trouble if the game was here. I could get up in time to go meet that 8 o'clock class. But, uh, and you were still in law school when, when you really uh, got associated by your father in, in your first real case. Well, I was, <laughs> yes, in a sense. Do you remember that case? I sure do. And, and where was it? Right uh, here in Knoxville. Uh, well, where the, where the uh, episode that I was involved in uh, took place. And your father gave you a call and, and asked to do a little bit of uh, there was a, uh, on an issue. There was a, a murder. A, a Glenn Smeltzer from, from Greene County was charged with uh, throwing his wife off the bridge, Swans Bridge, in Jefferson County into the French Broad River. And, uh, of course, killed her. And um, he was represented by a firm of lawyers, uh, Kilgore and Easterly, out of uh, Greenville, uh, his home county, of course. And um, that firm employed my father as a local attorney to uh, join him. 
and uh, it, was just, it was a case that uh, created quite a bit of dis discussion, people up and down the uh, road and over the byways. And uh, uh, the judge, George Shepard, no, it was George, yeah, George Shepard, uh, would not allow bail. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> a habeas corpus petition was filed by the, the attorneys and uh, seeking bail. And uh, they filed it, and knowing what <clears throat> Judge Shepard would probably do with it, they filed it before Judge Hamilton Burnett, who was on the circuit bench here in Knoxville. And who labored, later became Chief Justice, Chief Chief Justice, Justice, Justice Court, of the Tennessee yeah. Supreme Court. And um, <clears throat> so... Uh, my father called me. I was, of course, in law school, and uh, told me about the situation. I knew that what was going on anyway, and uh, asked me to do some research on the matter of when a uh, person that, uh, under those circumstances were entitled to bail. And I did. I, uh, I researched it uh, pretty thoroughly, and came to the conclusion that uh, under these circumstances, the whole case was purely circumstantial. They didn't have any, any direct uh, evidence, the state did. So um, they uh, were having a hearing, Judge Burney, uh, set a hearing on Saturday morning. And um, uh, so we heard it in the old courthouse over here. And I attended. And uh, I had presented to the Greenville lawyers and my father what I had found, and uh, um, they were impressed with the, the law that I, I gave to them. And, um, I don't recall exactly how it came, came about or how it came up, but um, uh, those of us who knew uh, Justice Burnett, uh, um, you know, he was, he was a, a wonderful person, uh, individual, judge, any way you want to look at it, it was ideal. In my, certain in my mind, I think most people. But somehow he found out that I had, had uh, researched. And uh, when one of the lawyers got up, one of the Greenville lawyers got up, and he, uh, he made some remark about, uh, I believe this had been worked on by a law student or something. Anyway, he said if this law student was there in the courtroom, he knew it was. Uh, wanted to present it, and it's all right with the lawyer he'd like to hear from. So that was my first introduction so, to. Uh, so you argued the case. I you argued, argued the argued issue the of case. bail. Mm -hmm. Then you did it on a petition for habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. What happened? We got a bond of $10,000, got him out on the bond. And, uh, proof is evident and the presumption great. And we argued that, that that, that was the criteria. They couldn't meet it. So your first day in court was a successful one. That one, one I've always treasured, uh, and uh, the kindness and that uh, he would, in effect, wave all. There was no one in the courtroom. Uh, it wasn't uh, a big deal. But you imagine Saturday morning in Knoxville and in those days, uh, and uh, so it was just the parties and uh, interested people. It wasn't. wasn't now you mentioned the legal bib teacher who kept you away from football games. Or tried to at least, but you you had well, a he 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 could care less. <laughs> <laughs> but you had you had a couple of professors that were very close to you and meant a lot to you during those years. Well, uh, yes, uh, Robert M. Jones, who was a, a chancellor here in Knoxville for many years, uh, uh, just an outstanding person and a wonderful teacher. Uh, uh, he wouldn't put up with any. <laughs> he taught equity. He taught equity and constitutional, and taught constitutional law. law and uh, something else I believe I don't remember. And um, then and there was Harold Warner, who was uh, who was dean while I was in law school, and but uh, real real estate. He he was uh, the real estate uh, professor and uh, the uh, future interests uh, that we all love so well, you know. Now, Professor Jones, uh, to go to him just a minute, had um, uh, is a part of several texts that he referred to, Gibson Suits and Chancery, and that was, that was and is perhaps the Bible for, for chancellors even today. 
Do you recall a specific instance when um, when you relied perhaps too much on Gibson? There were several of those times. <laughs> they got the same answer each time. But Judge Judge Jones was uh, elderly uh, in those those days. I don't know. He was anyway. He's had a bald head and had a do inky on the top up there that he would rub all the time, sit there at the table. And of course, he he, he um, insisted that he had read every reported case in Tennessee. That was, he, he didn't mind telling you about that. Mm -hmm. So he'd sit there at his desk and um, we'd be going through a, a subject or something and it just suddenly, with, without uh, breaking anything, he'd say, Mr. Rainwater, and he'd give me a question to answer. And I'd give him an answer. Now, this is not me alone. It was He did this to everybody. And um, I'd give him an answer. And he'd say, where about the crash it? He'd say, where'd you get that? I said, out of Gibson's. He said, turn out that page. <laughs> <laughs> that was his way to tell me that uh, I guess he figured, I had flunked that particular part of it. I guess he figured he had thought he had taught uh, Chancellor Gibson a lesson or two that he didn't perhaps <laughs> digest. In September of 1940, you began your practice of law, but you were really a lawyer uh, licensed to practice in Tennessee before that. How did that happen? I was uh, going to school, of course, uh, I say, of course, going to school summer and all uh, to try to get completed as soon as I could. And um, they gave the bar exam in July, in January and July. And uh, January was approaching and uh, I don't remember how it came up, but uh, I decided that I'd try to take the bar exam. You could do that in those days. But uh, you had to be certified in certain listed subjects. I lacked two or three, as I recall, constitutional law, and I don't remember what that does. But anyway, um, in those days you could study in, in a lawyer's office and be certified by the lawyer on those subjects, and uh, that met the requirements. So uh, uh, Francis Hedman, I, I knew Francis quite well, and uh, he, uh, I did, I, I studied in his, his office, and Francis was very good. He certified me. I met the qualification, took the bar exam, and on March the 20th of 1940, uh, I was notified that I'd passed. So you went back to practice law when you finished, when you got your law degree then in, in September of 1940, but that, your initial tenure at uh, Rainwater and Rainwater didn't last all that long. No, uh, about a year approximately. And what happened? Well, the war was imminent, uh, and uh, things were very unsettled. Um, it's hard to describe if you didn't live through that, that particular time. But um, I made a trip to Marstown to the Register of Deeds office. That's where I was going to courthouse on this particular occasion. And as I drove up to the uh, front of the courthouse, um, I saw this friend of mine, Dexter Christenberry. I think most of you people probably know still, Dexter. Uh, he's a prominent person here in Knox. Still practices law. Still practices the law and, and very fine, very fine person. Um, Dexter, I'd known him in law school and we'd had uh, some dates together with a, a double dates. And uh, so uh, we were fairly close. He came running out of there and I was wondering First the fastest I've ever seen him move. But he came out and he greeted me like uh, I was really his lost cousin. And uh, come find out that uh, he had applied for uh, uh, F to be appointed an FBI agent. And on that particular morning, he had received his uh, notice that he'd been accepted. But he was employed at that time by TVA in the land acquisition department. They were building Cherokee dam um, over in Granger County, some of us in Hamlin County. And um, the rule was in the, in the federal, federal agencies, 
uh, that uh, you could not leave your position uh, without uh, the approval of your immediate supervisor and uh, on up the line, or uh, to find someone to replace you because it was difficult to find uh, personnel in those days. And he seized upon me to uh, take his place and uh, so that he could accept the uh, appointment to, as an FBI agent. Well, <laughs> it shook me up to tell you the truth. And he pointed out, he said, now this is, this will be, a, you work for the government, too. this will be a, a draft firm, a draft firm. And uh, of course, in those early days uh, before the war actually uh, broke out, we did, no one knew what was going to happen. You try to cover all bases. So before I could realize it, he had me in the car and went down, took me down to the, their headquarters office, TV headquarters office for that project downtown, and so his his boss and um, introduced me and. Uh, they tried to sell me on taking the position. And to uh, make a long story short, I did. Uh, he went to the FBI, I went to TVA, uh, worked with the TVA on Cherokee and Douglas Dam until uh, September of 42 when I went to Army Air Force. He, as a chancellor, you were noted for your expertise in real estate in particular. Is this how that interest began? <laughs> I thought uh, in law school, it came to future interest, real property, those, those things, that uh, I just said to myself, now, if I'm lucky enough to get out and pass the bar, I'm not going to deal in real property. And uh, so, I had followed through on that until they got me into that uh, land acquisition department where we uh, abstracted the titles. We uh, went out and obtained all the information, made uh -huh. the deal, closed the deal. And, uh, and you couldn't help but learn some uh, real estate law, practical law. It, ironically, uh, even, even though this was a new and exciting job and one with the a federal agency, it really didn't take you away from, from Dandridge it, it, in many ways because you spent much of your time in the Jefferson County Registry of Deeds office during this time. Well, after, after they authorized Douglas Dam, that's right. Made you appreciate the, the wonders of indexing in a real estate office. Oh, well, <laughs> it had to be done. It, it, was, it was a hodgepodge. And the Register of Deeds had no indexing system. Well, it, they had one, but it was totally inadequate, as you might imagine, with changing the Register of Deeds ever so often and this, that, and the other. Anyway, TVA decided, and well, rightfully so, that the first thing they would do would be to go through every volume of record in the Register of Deeds office and make uh, cards on it and sit down and make uh, indexes, which you did. And those indexes still exist today and still in use today. And it's been one of the greatest assets that Jefferson County has ever had. And, and some of it, I suppose, is in your handwriting, is it not? Well, it, you'll see my... <laughs> well, I made notations here and there. Well, you spent um, about a year and a half in, in TVA. Yes. And, until uh, September of 1942, and of course in August you'd, you'd just gotten married to, to Phyllis, and what happened the next month? I believe the military may have called. Oh, I, the, the military had called. Uh, the military had called before, before we were married. I knew that that was, that was on the horizon. It was inevitable. Um, but, uh, where did uh, where were you first stationed when you went into the United States Army? Miami Beach, and in, Air, in Air Corps. And um, what were your duties there? Were they law related? Uh, well, somewhat. Um, um, I went in. Of course, uh, I was drafted. Went in as, as private, and I was assigned to uh, the intelligence uh, 
group and the uh, see the Air Force had taken over all of Miami Beach, all those hotels, stocked them with military uh, GIs and personnel, and uh, uh, they had set up the officer candidate schools uh, there at Miami Beach and. A part of our job in the in intelligence department where I worked uh, was reviewing applications of people for uh, entrance, entrance to the uh, officer candidate school. And um, I worked oh, a few months on that and got to know the ropes pretty well. And I decided, well, if I'm going to be in this, in this uh, Air Force, there's no reason why I shouldn't see if I can't be, be, be an officer. So I applied for it, was accepted, and went to OCS of Clark Gable and um, Robert Preston. Robert, Robert Preston. Robert, Robert Survey. We knew him as. He, he wasn't Robert Preston and down there marching up and down the streets of Miami Beach. He was Robert Survey. And uh, that uh, famous catcher for Detroit uh, Tigers, not Mickey Cochran, but the next one. Anyway, people like that, and then. Uh, uh, so you actually went to officers' candidate school with Clark Gable. Well, uh, we were uh, two among several hundred. Uh, this was after Gone with the Wind, so he was he was a he was quite famous by that time. Oh yeah, and so was uh, so was. Uh, Robert Preston, uh, he's not, not as famous, of course, as Clark Gable, but... Um, well, perhaps it worked out best. They got into the acting business and you got into the judging business and they were probably best suited in the acting and you were best suited in the judging. Well, we like to look back <laughs> on it that way. <laughs> and uh, after you became an officer, and I'll, I'll let you talk about the, the rank you ultimately achieved during your uh, four years or so in, in the military, but, but you actually did get back into to the legal field and, and spent much of your time. Uh, well, the, uh, the day I graduated uh, from that law, it was three months, uh, three months school, uh, that, uh, they put 250 of the newly uh, uh, officers, second lieutenants, on this special train in Miami, uh, not Beach, but over in Miami because the railroad didn't go over to Miami Beach, and um, sent us to Santa Ana, California, seven days on that train. Um, but it was first class all the way, um, and a special train, and we'd go and stop and. We uh, laid over in New Orleans for a uh, day and a half. Uh, they had to switch tracks in those days and so on and so forth, and we got to play around there. But anyway, it was, it was a pleasant trip. And uh, then uh, we were assigned to the Western Flying Training Command as uh, I was as a legal officer because I had my law degree and had practiced it. And, uh, from there then, I was sent out to uh, the air base, a little air base at Fort Sumner, New Mexico, as the legal officer. And uh, uh, later became the law member of general court marshals for the second air force, uh, which covered all the bases from Miss the Mississippi River to the Pacific. Uh, in other words, uh, if a general court martial was to be convened in Davis uh, Monson Field in in Tucson, and they needed a law member for the general court martial, well, they'd cut orders, and I would fly out to that bay. I, to, I, any and all the bases that call for a, a law member of the general court martial. While, while the general court martial had several members, the law member, as I understand, had special powers. Oh yeah. Uh, the law member, uh, regardless of his rank, whether he's a second lieutenant or a five-star general, uh, made all the decisions as to ruling on evidence, all of the legal rulings, and the, the uh, other uh, members of the court could not 
overrule or interfere or modify in any way what that law member rule was it. And uh, the law member then had a, had a vote uh, on the ultimate uh, decision of the, of, of the matter before it. Uh, many of the cases, and most of them, were criminal cases. That is, uh, we had several murder cases uh, throughout that, uh, and we had some very unpleasant uh, uh, matters where uh, officers, uh, colonels, you know, they got out of hand, uh, misbehaved terribly, and um, things like that. And then we had uh, also to do do uh, claims work uh, with uh, accidents happened involving military personnel with our duty to our staff to uh, check those things and f give you an example of sitting at the office uh, uh, one afternoon uh, nothing going on particularly telephone rang said get to Santa Rosa that was about 20 or 25 miles across some of the desert there that uh, an airplane fighter this, this base was a training place for fighter pilots an airplane fighter plane had uh, flown over a, a school a little school out in the uh, very uh, open area it was just not, not near the town or anything and um, had a flag on a flagpole the top of that flagpole was 26 feet from the ground that plane had flown into that flagpole, cut off about 18 inches at the top of a two-inch galvanized pipe, and threw it 300 and some yards. And it hit a Mexican who lived there and a farmer there who was in the doorway of his barn and hit him on the knee and just absolutely shattered it. Hmm. And so... We had to go do that, and then we had to... Do you recall the specific punishment in that case? Um, no, you see, I, I investigated it, and um, so I didn't sit on any, any court-martial uh, uh, there, but uh, it was uh, written up by all the, the papers over there. Can you imagine flying a, mm. a fighter plane at that speed at 26 feet off the ground? Amazing. Of and, course, you are in flat country, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, New Mexico and California is, is where you were stationed during the during the war. Well, I was, my, my station was always in New Mexico, but I went from uh, to all these other bases on a per call basis, and uh, I wound up. Uh, we closed Fort Sander, Fort Sumner. Uh, base in uh, October of 1945, after the war was over. And uh, then I took over as legal officer for Kirtland Field in Albuquerque and uh, was there in that p position until uh, I was discharged. And what was your rank at that time? Captain. Well, a, a captain as I went out. 